Formerly an historical fact needed only the authority of tradition to be generally received and duly established. But in the present day, the critic is not so easily satisfied and insists upon proof as a basis for his belief. In the field of history, we meet with many contested points, but it is rare to find an error persistently maintained during 500 years in spite of the refutation of innumerable authors. This is the case with the tale of William Tell, which is nothing more nor less than a northern saga that has been adopted and repeated from generation to generation. The revolution which took place in Switzerland in 1307 gave rise to the legend of the Swiss hero, and from that time to the present, writers have continually endeavored to expose its unsound basis, but the public, equally pertinacious, have insisted on believing in its truth. The study of historical and popular legends is the study of a peculiar phase of the human mind and is one of the aspects under which the history of a people should be considered. All epochs of ignorance or superstition have been remarkable for a strong belief in the marvelous. The object of belief may vary, but the disposition to believe is the same. In order to place the history of William Tell as clearly as possible before the reader, let us in the first place turn to the writings of the old Swiss chroniclers. Conrad Justinger, who died in 1426, is one of the most ancient. He was Chancellor of the city of Bern, and the composition of a chronicle of this canton was committed to him. It does not extend beyond the year 1421. Melchior Russ Registrat at Lucerne in 1476 copies word for word in his chronicle the narrative of Conrad Justinger concerning the political state of the Waldstetten, their disputes with the Habsburg dynasty, and the insurrection of the country. The Bernese chronicler attributes the insurrection of the Alpine peasantry to the services required and the heavy burdens imposed upon them by the House of Habsburg, and to the ill treatment the men, women, and girls endured from the governors of the country. In support of this accusation, Melchior Rus cites an example. He says, William Tell was forced by the Seneschal to hit with an arrow an apple placed on the head of his own son, failing in which he himself was to be put to death. It is here that Rus takes up the narrative of Justinger and continues the history of Tell in a chapter entitled Adventure of Tell on the Lake. Tell resolved to avenge himself of the cruel and unjust treatment he had long endured from the governor and the magistrates. He went into the canton of Uri, assembled the commune, and told them with sobs of emotion of the tyranny and persecution to which he was every day exposed. His complaints coming to the ears of the governor, he ordered Tell to be seized, to be bound hand and foot, and to be carried in a boat to a fortified castle situated in the center of the lake. During the passage across a violent tempest arose, and all on board, giving themselves up for lost, began to implore the aid of God and of the saints. It was suggested to the governor that Tell, being vigorous and skilled in nautical matters, was the only one likely to help them out of their danger. Aware of their imminent peril, the governor promised that Tell's life should be spared if he succeeded in landing all the passengers in safety. On his promising to do so, he was set free and maneuvered so well that he steered close to a flat rock, snatched up his crossbow, leapt ashore at one bound and, aiming at the governor, shot him dead. The crew were home away in the boat, which Tell had quickly pushed off from the shore and he regained the interior, where he continued to excite the people to rebellion and to revolt. Other chroniclers have followed the same story, sometimes modifying it, and at others subjecting it to a critical examination. Now there are four different views existing of this tradition of William Tell. The first admits the authenticity of the legend in all its details, as it is believed in the canton of Uri. The second admits the existence of Tell, his refusal to do homage to the hat, his voyage on the lake, and the tragical end of Gessler. But it rejects the story of the apple. According to the third view, William Tell is believed to have existed and to have made himself remarkable by some daring exploit, but this exploit was not connected with the plans of the conspirators and consequently exercised no influence over the formation of the Swiss Confederation. The fourth view supposes the tradition of William Tell to be a mere fable, an afterthought, unworthy of being inserted in any history of Switzerland. However, it is far from being the fact that all the historical works written by the contemporaries of this hero have been destroyed or buried in oblivion. 
Freudenberger, in his Danish fable, has cited several of them. Franz Gilliman, in his work De Rebus Helveticis, published at Fribourg in 1598, inserted the history of William Tell, although he regarded it as a mixture of fiction and probable facts, or rather, as a conventional truth that does not bear examination, for he cast a doubt upon the very existence of the personage whose memory the Swiss people honor as their liberator. In conclusion, we will cite a legend analogous to the circumstance of the apple shot in Twain by William Tell. The large forests of England were for many years formidable to the Normans. They were inhabited by the last remnants of the Saxon armies, who still disputing the conquest, persisted in leading a life opposed to the laws of the invader. Everywhere driven out, pursued, hunted like wild beasts, they here, favored by the shelter of the forests, had been able to maintain themselves in force under a sort of military organization. Among the chief outlaws, Adam Bell, Climb of the Claw, and William of Cloudesley were not the least celebrated. Bound together by the same destiny, they had taken an oath of fraternity, as was customary in the 12th century. Adam and Klim were not married, but William had a wife and three children, whom he had left at Carlisle. One day he resolved to visit them. He set off in spite of the counsels of his companions and arrived at night in the city. But being recognized by an old woman, he was denounced to the magistrate, his hoose was surrounded, he was multi prisoner and a gallows was erected in the marketplace on which to hang him. A young swineherd informed Adam and Klim of the fate of their brother in arms. The sentence was about to be executed when the two friends of the condemned man appeared in the marketplace and a sanguinary combat ensued which terminated in the delivery of the prisoner. The three outlaws, however, worn out at length with their wandering life, decided upon making their submission. They arrived in London with the eldest son of William of Cloudsley, entered the king's palace without uttering a word to anyone, proceeded into the hall and kneeling on one knee, raised their hands and said, Sire, deign to pardon us. What are your names? demanded the king. Adam Bell, Klim of the Cloth and William of Cloudsley. Ah, you are then those brigands of whom I have heard. I swear to God you shall all three be hung. They were immediately arrested by the king's order. But the queen, moved by the unhappy fate of these three men who had voluntarily surrendered themselves, interceded for them and obtained their pardon, but on condition that they should be victorious in a shooting match with the king's archers. Two branches of a hazel tree were fixed in the ground, in a field at a distance of twenty times twenty paces. None of the king's men-at-arms could hit this mark. "'I will try,' said William, and he bent his bow and took so true a name that the arrow split the branch. Thou art the best archer that I have seen in the whole course of my life, said the astonished king. To please my sovereign lord, said William, I would do something still more surprising. I have a son of the age of seven years. I love this son with an extreme tenderness. I will attach him to a post in the presence of everyone. I will place an apple upon his head, and at the distance of a hundred and twenty paces, I will pierce the apple without wounding the child. I take thee at thy word, but if thou failest, thou shalt be hung. What I have promised, said William, I will perform. He fixed a stake in the ground, fastened his son to it, and, having made him turn away his head, placed the apple upon it. After taking these precautions, William went to a distance of a hundred and twenty paces, bent his bow, besought all present to keep strict silence, and let fly the arrow, which pierced the apple without touching the child. God preserve me from ever serving as an aim to thee, exclaimed the king, the skillful archer, his brethren in arms, and his wife and children were conducted to the court, where the king and queen loaded them with favors. This trial of skill of William of Cloudsley still dwells in the memory of the people. Several English poets make mention of the fact, and the old English ballad has furnished Sir Walter Scott with many particulars of the scene of the archery meeting in Ivanhoe.